My final guest this hour is Margaret Spellings. She's a former president of the University of North Carol Carolina. And before that, she was education secretary from President George W. Bush. She crafted and led the no Leave No Child Behind Act. I was very uh, 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 impressed with it. It's hard to move anything in Washington, but that was a big deal. Margaret Spellings is the current president and CEO of Texas 2036, a nonprofit focusing on the future prosperity of Texas. Uh, Secretary Spellings, it's so great to see you again, and we're very happy to have you here. Well, let me just ask you, we're at a time of like economic crisis, health crisis, you know, racial divisions, and it's all happening down in Texas too. So how do you solve it all by 2036? Well, we stay focused on the most important things over the long haul. We set, held, hold ourselves accountable. Uh, for making progress around these big goals like closing the achievement gap or greater health access, better health outcomes, broadband ubiquity, on and on. And we've articulated 36 really important goals for our state. We're holding ourselves accountable for achieving them. You know, you've been a bit critical of the current education secretary's um, approach during the pandemic. And, and I'd love to kind of hear what you think the gaps are, what is not happening that federal leadership should be doing during a time of crisis. And I have to admit, you see a lot of mixed messages going on out there. What can they do to give greater clarity and what would your priorities, um, would you suggest should be? Well, well, I think it's been a missed opportunity and consequently people are not looking to Washington for guidance or leadership in the, in the school realm. I think in early days, six months ago, it would have been terrific uh, had experts in technology, public health, mental health, space utilization, uh, interacting with parents, on and on, had been assembled so that we, could, so that that kind of expertise could have been brought to bear. Instead, people all over the country are are figuring it out on their own, and some interesting uh, lessons and and entrepreneurship is coming from that. So that's not all bad. Fast forward to today. I hope and I expect that the U.S. Department of Education will be uh, bringing to bear a research agenda so that we will learn uh, what has worked, what hasn't worked, uh, what are the conditions for success, uh, and that's an important role that the federal government can also play through their, their resources. And then finally, uh, and I commend Secretary DeVos for this, you know, the, the entire reason for the U.S. Department of Education is around civil rights, Title I schools, special needs children, and so on. And so how well are we serving uh, all of our students in these challenging times? Secretary, you know, I'm trying to think back um, uh, to, to 1998, 1999, you know, this period um, of time, you know, Senator Lamar Alexander was raising questions and, and, and raving flags about the inequality of school funding, the inequality of access. So this, is, this has been around us, and it's in part what the, the No Child Left Behind Act came, came from. You know, I'm interested in whether you see that the silver lining in this moment might be the technology platforms that we're on. You know, people have always talked about in-person education being so important, and I think you're there. But are there other pieces that can be solved in this puzzle from online education? We had Sal Khan on earlier today. I'm just wondering if greater institutionalization and partnership might get us to a different place, whether you would be on board with that sort of exploration. Absolutely, but first we need broadband and device ubiquity, and we can get into that. But one of the things I'm most excited about is to the extent that people have freaked out about high stakes testing, uh, you know, we'll be able to embed uh, progress monitoring along the way with students and with teachers uh, in technology-based products and, and curriculum offerings. So that's, that's another silver lining. Uh, and the use of technology and the rapid uh, renaissance that I think we're going to see out of this. Now, you have um, advocated something I found very interesting, which is doing standardized testing post-pandemic to see what we've lost, to see you know, where the deficits are uh, in the educational picture. Um, how would that work? And, and you have, is, is anybody saying, yeah, let's do that? Uh, are they on board? They are. And I, I, in fact, I was just uh, heard an interview with our superintendent here in Dallas, Mike Hinojosa, uh, talking about how they were going to give every student a diagnostic test this fall, uh, figure out how much loss there had been since the spring. I like to say we need to care enough to find out mm. how our students are doing. The same people that are running around saying test, test, test in the COVID world are often the same folks who are saying, let's not find out where we're doing, let's not hold ourselves accountable. Look, we're at risk of losing a generation of kids. Uh, it will hurt them, obviously, our economy, our prosperity, and so we have got to pull up 
intervene as quickly as possible, but the first step is finding out uh, where our students are. Now, I've talked to the Dallas superintendent uh, of schools before, Mike Hinojosa, and he's done incredible things with connectivity and, as you said, devices and, you know, really a lot of the other discussion is digital divide here. And you raised it. What do you think we need to be doing to connect every student and to look at, as you said, device ubiqu ub ubiquity? <laughs> We have, about nearly six million yeah. students. we have about six million students here in Texas, slightly short of that. And going into this, we had, you know, 1.8 million students who, whether uh, through a lack of broadband or a lack of devices, uh, did not have access to e-learning. Hmm. Uh, in urban areas, that's about affordability because, it, it, you know, these services are expensive. And so we need our big providers to to walk forward with us and, and make these services available in affordable ways. Secondly, in a big rural state like Texas is with 3 million of Texans, more than 18 states living in rural communities, we need broadband. And uh, our federal policies can be more supportive of doing that. I hope the Congress will provide some resources and some policy changes around that. And likewise, uh, our states need to plan and get to work on closing that divide. That will be key, obviously, to uh, massive improvements in e-learning. Look, you're, you're a pro at Washington. You understand how this place works. And I just want to ask you perhaps an unfair question. Are we siloing the education debate too much? You know, when we're talking, you know, we just had Jessica Rosenworcel on, you know, from E-Rate and, and, and talked about this, but we've talked about carriers, broadband carriers, municipal networks, you know, some of these other things that aren't typically part of talking about education. Do you think we need to do have more convergence so that the different players are actually brought. So we talk about, okay, how do we improve educational access and opportunity and, and, and create greater justice and reach communities? And that is going to force us to bring in uh, uh, the tech folks and look at things like municipal networks versus carriers. It, it, exactly. I, I'm just wondering if we've silo these topics too much. We have, and I think, again, a place that there could have been, you know, uh, impressive and, and useful federal leadership. I mean, what, what would this picture look like had we convened education leaders, technology leaders, public health leaders, the CDC, Secretary DeVos, uh, the folks at the FCC, uh, among others, you know, partnering together around these issues and, and started those conversations six months ago? I couldn't agree more. Um before we go, I would love to hear a little bit more about the sizzle of Texas 2036 and, uh, you know, how, you know, you're going to you be, be uh, uh, approaching this. What are the big pillars uh, of the program there? Um, because I think a lot of the nation, frankly, whether, you know, they're, a hundred, you know, two centuries or a century old or whatever, are looking for moments of inspiration and, and projects to work on. So what are some of the areas that you're leading on? Exactly. And, I, you know, I think we all are aware in our politics that too often we're talking about bathroom bills or monuments or this or that, uh, not unimportant issues, but not the meat and potatoes of government like education and health, highways and infrastructure, broadband, natural resources, justice and safety, uh, our public safety nets, all of those most important issues that we have to get right. You know, the, the winner of the race in our country and around the world will be who develops their people uh, in the most productive ways. Healthy people are educated people. Healthy, educated people build economies and communities. They're civically engaged and on and on. So we need to build that civic demand, as I like to call it, for this long-term thinking on these most important things, hold ourselves accountable for progress along the way, and, and turn these institutions into uh, mega producers of human prosperity. It's fascinating. I hope you'll come back and talk to the Hill at various stages of, uh, of, of getting this done. Secretary Margaret Spellings, president and CEO of Texas 2036, former secretary of education uh, uh, for our nation, but based, you know, when she was here in Washington, D.C. So good to see you and thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thanks, Steve. Good to be with you.